And it's the nearly one-third scale Seagull Pete and Paul Air Camper from Legend Hobby. Now, the real air camper is a late 1920s design that was one of the earliest home-built aircraft marketed. It was initially powered by a 40-horsepower converted Model A car engine and could carry two people. Many air campers are still flying to this day. So today, I will be assembling this 108-inch span version designed for 40 to 60 cc engines or equivalent electron burners. The built-up ball supply wings are nicely covered in black film with orange and white trim. The obligatory servo lead pull strings are there for your convenience. Servo bolts are strongly glued together. Under control surfaces, robot-style heavy-duty hinge points are a nice touch. Wing center section is fully sheeted and has the wing bolt mounts. Note the four points for the strut mounts. Tail controls are lightly built with more hinge points. Cockpit area has rubber trim. Well, fuselage is mostly open structure. Engine firewall has fiberglass reinforcements and what looks to be some knockout panels. Under the hood, there's some pretty nice woodwork with copious space for all the electronics. These two vertical servo slots seem an odd addition. Hmm. Fiberglass cowl is quite intriguing with dummy cylinders and some neat grill work. We felt strong and looked well layered. You get a decent pilot figure, but he's seen a bit out of place for the air camper. All right, let's start the assembly. We'll start with the ailerons, where I'll use some silicon grease to protect the hinge axles from the glue before epoxying the hinges into place. Fiberglass control horns are painted, so a quick discussion with some sandpaper is needed before gluing into place. Now to mount the aileron servos. I'll be using high-tech D645 high voltage servos, which fit snugly into the mounts. Big wings will need a long servo extension. This is where the pull strings come in handy. The servo mounts are then secured into the wing. Control linkages are heavy-duty rods with swivel ball links, which is good to see on such a large model. With the ailerons done, I moved on to the fuselage with the tail servos. And convenient slots for the power switches. Next was the undercarriage, which was more than met the eye. Okay, so I thought I'd stop and talk about the undercarriage components for a second, because they were actually kind of interesting. Now you have the uh, metal, uh, I guess strut you can call it, which seems to be actually a little more intricate the more I look at it. So we have what looks to be uh, a, a sort of some sort of steel assembly, truss assembly, with some angled components that are welded on really quite nicely and painted. And it, what's interesting is that you can almost hear the echo. And uh, that is, there is covering over the strut assembly. And it's kind of hard to see. It's just black. I guess it's just a low temp covering, but it's kind of neat. So it kind of hides that just for trust work. That's pretty nice. Uh, the wheels themselves are nothing special. These are uh, basically World War One-ish kind of wheels with a simulated spoke and sort of foam, hard foam rubber wheels. Uh, so um, they, they'll they'll do the job. But don't don't write home about them. Uh, but what really caught my eye was these. These sort of interconnected st struts. That go in the middle and I, they come already attached with the some, some boot material and I said well that's interesting what to do the work to do that but as I start feeling I said hey wait a minute this sounds feels like there's some sort of spring in there and the diameters are different so I said wow I wonder if this is a telescoping tube of some sort so what I did is grab a couple of hand holders a basically just a hex driver and another hex driver 
here because I can't take really take these boots off very easily. It's, it's stuck on there. But you know, I can't compress it. I tried compressing it, so that's not working. I said, well, wait a minute, it's in the middle. When the wheels, when you land, the wheels come out, so it's actually in tension. So, and I can feel the springs in there, and so I actually, you can't really see it, but I can actually pull these apart slightly. So they are functional. This is a functional uh, shock absorbing struts uh, using springs that are really tight. So, but I imagine once they get all the weight, you know, approaching probably 20 pounds with this plane, um, it'll, it'll be, be better. I don't want to bend my hex drivers either, but uh, so that's pretty cool that there's actually functional. Yeah, I'll pump you up. Uh, struts in here that were actually take uh, some of the low when landing. So that's pretty cool. I look forward to see how that actually works in in actual flight operations and not just theory. Uh, if it really absorbs everything or just makes the thing bounce like a kangaroo. We'll see. But anyways, let's go on and attach the landing gear to the fuselage. So to install it, you'll need to screw on some brackets, and don't forget the thread lock. Then the legs, which pivot hinge-like using screws, with fittings for the guide wires. Center bracket is then added. And then the spring struts. The one side wouldn't allow the boat through, so I opened up the hole slightly which did the trick. Wheels are then installed. With their legs on, we move to the fuel tank. A pretty nice 17 ounce unit with separate fill and vent lines. If you plan to go electric, there is an adjustable length motor box with mounting hardware buried inside. But I plan on burning dinosaurs. All right, so for motivation, this will have, I want to understand, is a relatively new engine, the Stinger 63 cc's. I guess they milled it out to get an extra three cc's from a 60 size engine or so. Not sure, sure how that works. But this is interesting because uh, I haven't had a Stinger engine this big. Usually I think I've the 40 twin is the biggest I've had. And bigger than that, I was at uh, EME was the last model I had. So, be interesting to see how this runs. This is an interesting looking engine. You've got a cast head, it looks like, and then uh, also cast body, but it's, it's interesting that there's a, the color difference means the casting is slightly different. Or maybe they did some post-processing on the actual crankcase. It's whatever that is. And uh, I'm not an expert, so don't listen to me. Uh, it's interesting how the carburetor looks to be inset slightly uh, within the back plate. I thought that's interesting, so it doesn't stick out too much. I like that. I like the shape of that jib. And we got the normal stuff. We've got the, the throttle, which has already has a nice long arm on it. Kudos to that, because I always change the arms. And then you got the choke, a uh, little nipple for the input, high and low uh, mixture settings are on the bottom, which is interesting. So I believe I will be installing it inverted I believe that'll go just like that and huh, which means the pictures are on the top instead of the side that's interesting and of course there's a, a nice big muffler here interesting I think I'll just I should go like that hopefully it'll quiet down just a little bit uh, <laughs> looking inside is not really much in there it's just an open can so <laughs> it's probably not going to be the quietest thing in the world but who cares more power <laughs> All right, let's get this thing mounted. You get a multi-engine template, which matches up to DA and GT engines. Mm -mm. Some tape is used to hold it in place while I drill out the holes. I use pilot hole first, then enlarge them with template removed. Blind nuts are used inside the fuselage to hold the engine bolts. All right, let's see how the cowl fits on. Pretty close, but the engine standoffs were a bit short. Fortunately, I had some longer ones in the box. But the larger bolts didn't fit the crankcase. 
Which is why man created drill bits. There we go. Of course, they needed to install bigger blind nuts as well. I use the standoffs to pull the blind nuts through. Much better. But looking at the cowl screw holes, I see that the cylinder head is hitting the bottom of the cowl. Yeah, gonna need to turn that away. Kit has two servo mount brackets which I'll use for the throttle and choke servos. To fit the servos, they needed to be trimmed and sanded a bit. They are then glued inside the fuselage. Now to drill out the holes for the push rods. Which for the throttle is a ball link. I like that the engine has a long arm already installed. I generally prefer to use locking nuts for this control for security. With the engine test fitted, I could align and glue the throttle servo mount. So I whipped out my handy Z-Bend tool. To hook up the choke rod. I don't get too fancy with the choke as it doesn't need precise control. With the throttle and choke, we'll use easy style rod connectors for easy adjustment. Another place where lock nuts would be nice, but otherwise thread lock is a must. Servo arm is installed. Note that I stagger the throttle and choke servos at different heights so there is no conflicts. While the engine was once again removed, I drilled out some holes to mount the ignition module. Zip ties with a foam backing should keep it in place. Hopefully, this is the last time I need to remove the engine. I'm guessing these knockout panels are for electric power cooling. It was tight moved to the back of the bus with the horizontal tail. Where it's on to marking where to remove the covering for gluing. A sharp knife and a careful touch worked well for this operation. Then 30 minute epoxy spread on with extreme prejudice. Throw some weights on, then check for straight alignment with a ruler of the measuring type. When that is cured, then add the vertical fin. A handy triangle makes sure it's square. Rather large rudder completes the assembly. It's push rotting time. I really like that they went with a swivel ball link and 3mm screws for strength. The rudder pull pull cable is next, which will have to be fabricated from parts. Double check the link before you start, I mistakenly picked the wrong bag at first. There, that's the right ones. Wires are fed into guide tubes which exit out the rear. The end clevises are installed by looping the cable through the end fitting and crimping the coupling over the wires. Then the eyelet is installed. It's very simple once you've done a couple. Tailwheel is the same wonderful unit seen on other large-scale models from Seagull with machined aluminum and ball-bearing swivel. 
a long bolt, and some washers I used to affix the tail wheel. It was a bit of a tight fit, so I needed to pry the fork open slightly. There we go. Next comes the tail wheel control arm on the rudder. Then you can mount the tail wheel assembly. First up are the wheel pulley springs, which surprisingly one had broken end. Which however was pretty easy to fix by bending out a new loop with pliers. Now the rudder and tail wheel can be connected via the springs. Guide wires are next, which use small tabs bolted onto the stabilizers with 3mm screws. All the wires are custom made by you, so get comfortable and cancel all your appointments. It may take a while. Still with me? Okay, now we can work on the cabane struts. These are metal and screw into the fuselage with blind nuts first. I would make sure to use thread lock on these as well. Center wing box has its own set of strut brackets, but pay attention to the fact that they have a very slight angle to them. The instructions show the correct orientation. I left the stretch screws a little loose at first, so I could better align them to the wing box. I'll tighten them up later. There is a front cross member that will be need to be assembled. Two more blind nuts are hidden under the front turtle deck covering. Once the cross members are in place, the assembly really stiffens up. Now the wings get some attention. Where we screw in the strut mounts. And brackets. Speaking of struts, the ones on the air camper are all metal. With adjustable metal end fittings. A couple of fittings needed a bit of paint removed from the threads. Plastic bushings keep the struts from rubbing in the brackets. At this point, I decided to test fit the wings. Where I could adjust the struts to the correct length. Instead of screws, the strut bottoms are held on with pins. The inner struts can now be fitted. And lastly, the remaining guide wires. Then there was this... thing. <laughs> Alright, so I got to an interesting point in the manual where it said to install this. Now if you don't recognize this immediately, this is actually a... tow hook. Yes, it actually has provisions for a servo-controlled tow hook. Now, in theory, that sounds like a good idea. It'd be cool to tow up other planes and stuff with this. Except, this is not a tow plane. <laughs> the original Pete and Paul had a Model A engine rated for somewhere along the lines of 40 horsepower. So, I think the, besides barely being able to get out of its own way, I think the only thing it could tow was maybe a paper kite. So, I think we're going to go against the instruction manuals and not install a tow hook, as cool as it seems. It just, I think, just would be really out of place on a plane like this. So, this is actually a really nice kind of a tow hook. I, I will save it for maybe another plane that may be a, a better candidate for towing things up. And uh, leave this for now and get to finishing up the last few steps. Okay, back to that ill-fitting cowl. So, the engine head is getting in the way. Which means I'll need to cut out the bottom of that beautiful cowl. 
which makes me very sad. Anyways, I made a template with cardstock paper by tracing around the cylinder head. Tracing looks rough, but it doesn't need to be precise. Dang it, I need to take the engine off again. The sacrifices I make for these models. I need to trace the outline, but a black sharpie on a black cowl just won't work. So I'll scribe the outline with a scribing tool. A fairly light touch is all that's needed. Eh, not my best work. Which is why I'll use masking tape to better define the cutout. And drill out the corners. Say hello to my little friend. A file and some sanding to clean up the hole. And there we go. Fits like a glove. Well, maybe not. Well, of course, I completely forgot about the muffler, so I'm going to have to see how well that fits in and what I'll need to trim uh, the cowl to get the stupid muffler to fit. For those slow like me, this is a side exhaust engine, which means even more of the cowl will need to be cut away to make room. Maybe I should have went electric. In the meantime, I'll mark the spots and drill the cowl screws. And then cut the space for the muffler. It took a couple of test fittings, but I eventually got enough cut out to work. I guess it's a good time to install the fuel tank then, eh? And fuel filler port. Now I can finally hook up my receiver which has a nice spot for it on the switch deck. Instead of the kit's pilot figure, I got a lifelike one-third scale figure from Warbird Pilots. This big guy is really well sculpted and painted. His kung fu grip is extremely poseable. And just look at that high step. Just as impressive are his clothes which look great and are removable in layers. <laughs> With an awesome leather jacket. Boots come off too. Captain Kirk would be proud. Now the whole point is to see if I can get Mr. GQ here into the cockpit. I think I can squeeze him in by removing part of the floor wall in the rear cockpit. I won't be needing the boots. Get in there. I don't care what you smell. Hey, he fits. Crude, but effective. But will he fit? Indeed he does. Though he's riding a bit high. I should note there are a bunch of accessories included with him. Like leather helmet, gloves, glorious scarf, and some snazzy goggles. Which were required to compete the look. With them in place, I added the windshields. However, his ride height was really bugging me. So I added a zip tie seat belt to pull him down to a more scale location. Much better. And yes, the real ones are flown from the rear seat. I shall call him Fitzy. Dashboards use stick on decals. And there are even some joysticks. My signature drive weights are bolted on for balance. Looks like I needed four pounds of weight. Good thing this is a big plane. A Zora Scimitar prop completes the vintage look. Of 
you also get a large sheet of stick-on decals with some uh, liberties in the printing. Still, most of the rest are pretty nice and go on well. One nitpick though is the huge letters are all on one sheet, which I thought would look good, so I cut the letters out individually. And use some tape to keep alignment. Yeah, now that looks good. But I ain't done yet. Those white wheels need some color. So some careful masking is done on them. Then I could paint them with a near perfect match of Rustoleum Apple Red. Yeah, now we're ready for some flying. Let's go, Fitzy! Hi, thanks for watching. Please take a look at the video description below for special hobby view sales and discounts. Your purchases help support this channel. Happy modeling!